Um, it's about a kind of a boy that gets, or the first part of it, is about a boy that gets recruited to go and work up in a castle kind of on a hill. So it's not kind of set in any kind of particular time or place. Mother and father always said I wouldn't amount to much, but I've proven them wrong, don't you think? I'm sat up in the castle about to tuck into another meal, while they're stuck in the town down below. When I first came up here, we entered the, <coughs> we entered the courtyard through a large pair of wooden gates. Once we're inside the actual castle, Lieutenant Mulvane led us inside an entrance hall and told us to wait. It was made of stone, but not at all grand with no decoration. I thought it would look better than this, I said. Gregory started laughing. This isn't the main entrance, this is the servant's entrance. Why would he spend money on the likes of us? I thought we would present it to the general, that he would want to meet the people who were coming to work for him. But Lieutenant Mulvane came back with a man in worn trousers that was smeared with dirt, and a man in a cook's uniform. Men, you have, you have a choice. You can either go to work in the kitchens or in the stables. I barely started to think about which I might prefer, when Gregory started speaking. I'd like to work with the horses, sir. I did so during the war. Fine, you boy can work in the kitchen then. Welch will tell you what he needs doing. I'm not a boy, I'm 16, I said. Don't be insolent, Welch said, hitting me on the back of the head so hard that I almost lost my balance. The cook then took me through a door and down a narrow spiral staircase until we reached the kitchens in the basement. I knew there must be lots of people in the castle, but I was surprised at how much was going on just to prepare lunch. There was a massive range at which three, pe at which three people stood tendering to pans. Someone was carving a large ham, resting on a large wooden table in the middle of the room, and someone else was doing the same to a joint of beef. Welch took me through to the next room, where two sinks stood side by side. Stone is for pans, porcelain is for crockery and cutlery. You'll have to dry them yourselves as we're still short-staffed. Over the next couple of weeks, I settled into life in the castle. I shared a room in the basement with another kitchen hand, Peter. He'd been here for a year but I hadn't progressed that far, having only moved from washing the pots to peeling vegetables. But he wasn't a bad person to share a room with. He was quiet, but always willing to trade the gossip that he'd heard during the course of the day, no matter what time it was when we finally got to bed. He would pass on information about what was going on in the kitchen, whether he thought there might be an opening for me, whether Mulvane had been downstairs, news from my town and surrounding villages. But a lot of the stories seemed to be rumours about the general, he wasn't really seen by that many people. He seemed to limit his time to the three rooms that made up his chambers. He was paranoid about plots and fretted about his personal guards in case they wanted to kill him. Peter had heard that he had a large bedroom entirely filled with a bed. He said that the general conducted his business in the gallery with windows overlooking the valley, his desk located at the far end, forcing people to walk the entire length of the room before they reached him to transact their business. I don't know why you do that. Because it's intimidating, I said admiringly. I asked Peter how he thought I might be able to advance, but he just shrugged and said the general would look after us when we needed it the most. But I don't want looking after. I want to move on. I can't stay here forever. I went quiet and considered what skills it was that I could best offer to the cook. Peter had told me that his ledgers were always in a dreadful state, and the rumour was that Mulvane thought he was on the mate but hiding it through lousy bookkeeping. Well, he should keep them in better order then, shouldn't he? It's really not that difficult, I said, shuddering, as I thought of all the time I spent adding up the columns and the shop ledgers. And that night, I lay awake, wondering how I could manage to make myself of use and get out of the scullery. A couple of days later, Welch was starting to get really agitated. Peter ducked his head round the scullery door and told me it's because he expecting Mulvane to come back to look at his ledgers some time that day. I was scrubbing pans again, when I could hear him really shouting at one of the other kitchen hands. I poked my head out of the door, watched him throw a pan across the room before heading into the small cubby that served his office. I tried not to ring the cloth that I bought with me as I walked in. What? he said without looking up. If you're going to feed me some sub story about how you need to go home and visit some dying granny, forget it. I need you here. Please, sir, I think I could help you. He laughed and looked up at me. I very much doubt it, unless you have a brother you could bring up here to work in the kitchen too. No sir, it's just that I think I've proved myself as a hard worker, 
I used to do the accounts for my father's shop, and I wondered if I could help you with your ledgers. I, I hear you sometimes struggle with them, I said, trailing off. He sat back and put his hands together, letting out a deep sigh, looking up at a corner of the room. Thank God, this seemed to be going my way, I thought. I can tell you're ambitious, he said, standing up. He proffered me a hand and I went to shake it, but instead he slapped me hard down the face with his other hand. Insolent shit. Like I can't do my own ledgers and need the help of a lump like you, he said loudly. Now get back into the scullery where you belong. I started to walk out of the room, nursing my cheek, and he grabbed me by the collar, leaning down so his mouth was right next to my ear. There's no room for ambition in my kitchen, and I'll tell you something else. Every job that comes up, you're not going to know whether I would have given it to you or not, as you stand in the scullery all day, every day, washing pots. And with that, he pushed me out of his cubby. The cheek he'd struck took a few days to lose its redness, and the cook seemed even more real disposed towards me over the next couple of weeks. I looked out of the narrow window in our bedroom to the valley below and started to feel homesick. What I would have given for a boring afternoon in Father's shop, rather than being stuck in that goddamn scullery with my hands in hot water all day. But as I lay in bed one night, feeling sorry for myself, it occurred to me that I could appeal instead to the lieutenant. He had brought me up here and promised to find advancement for hard workers. He would surely help me out. So I kept my head down and awaited the next time that Mulvane came downstairs. When he finally did, I ventured out into the main kitchen and the cook started walking towards me, brandishing a cleaver. What on earth are you doing out of the scullery, you little tow rag? He said, shouting at me. I knew I didn't have long to talk to the lieutenant. Please, sir, do you remember when you came down to the town to recruit the new people? And you said there'd be opportunities to move on and get advancement. Lieutenant Mulvane looked stunned as well, which started to chase me around the kitchen. Only I don't see how I get to move on. I've been landed with the worst job here. I need to get out. Stop this now, both of you. The cook stopped panting, and I stood still next to the fire. You boy, Mulvane said, pointing at me. Come with me, and we'll see what we can do to find you something better, shall we? He grabbed me by the wrist and hauled me up the spiral staircase. I've got just the job for you. He marched me down a corridor before taking me up a broad staircase that was hung with tapestries. We stopped at the door and tied a landing halfway up, and he unlocked it and took me inside. It was a simply furnished room with a curved exterior wall. There was a narrow bed piled with boxes, chair, and a desk that was propped up with a couple of planks of wood. Do you know the people who live at the top of this staircase, boy? I shrugged. It's the general. It's where his suite is located, he said, sitting in the comfortable chair, leaving me standing. So he sleeps here, I asked. My boy, it will be you if you want to. It is connected to a very particular job I would like you to undertake. The, the duties will be straightforward and relatively light. It will be a great opportunity for you to serve me and the general. What would I be doing? Well, the food served upstairs needs very closely monitoring. And as you've no doubt realised, the cook can be a little particular about who watches what he's doing. We need someone to taste the food before it's sent in. Just someone to check that it's okay to eat. I smiled at him. This seemed easy. Welch would hate it if he knew somebody was approving the food before it was sent in. Cooks can be so temperamental. He rolled his eyes. So we need to keep your presence here a complete secret. You won't be allowed out and nobody else will be allowed in. No one must come to learn you're here or the whole thing will be ruined. Do you understand? I nodded. I would entirely understand if you didn't feel, feel up to the job. I can arrange for you to go back to the kitchen if you prefer. Which will it be? I looked again around the room. I'll do it, I said, excited to be undertaking such an important position. The lieutenant arranged my belongings to be brought up from my old room. And my only regret is that I haven't been able to tell Peter about where I've ended up. Because this job is really, really easy. Mulvane brings me books where I can while away the day. And I've read many about the history of our country, as well as novels and biographies. I think it stands to me in good stead if ever there's an advisory role that the general needs filling. Or perhaps one day I could write in a biography in a history of the Civil War. I look out of the window down to the valley in town. It all seems a bit smaller than it did when I was in the basement. I obviously don't get to socialise, but I have been able to listen to the dinners upstairs when they become raucous 
and catch some snatches of conversation. I don't get to see much daylight, but I do get to eat the delicious food that's brought in to me three times a day. It's always the same guard that brings it in. He watches me while I cut off a small slice and eat it, making sure to try each part of what's on the plate. When I've finished, he stands watching me and asks how I feel before he takes the plate out of the room and onto the general. The first day he came in, I just nodded, but then I started providing feedback, which is, I think, what Mulvane wanted me to do. I say, that's a bit spicy, or that could do with a bit more seasoning, or I'm not sure those flavours quite work together. I offered to start writing it down, because I wasn't sure he was taking it in properly. But I've been here a week, and nothing else has happened until a couple of hours ago. There was a lot of shouting on the landing. I opened the door to see what was going on and saw three guards strong-arming the cook upstairs. He was shouting, It's an outrage! I worked for him all through the Civil War, as they dragged him up. When he saw me, he momentarily stopped his struggle, his mouth gaping open as the guards dragged him along. You! What the fuck are you doing here? He shouted as they carried on dragging him up the stairs. And then, ten minutes later, a shot rang out. I opened the door again, but a guard appeared, pushing me back inside and shutting the door in my face. Eventually, the door opened again, and it was the usual guard with the meal on the tray. As the door was swinging shut, swinging shut I could see them carrying out the dead body of the cook, a gun hole in his head. What happened to him, I asked. The guard shrugged, but kept his eyes firmly on the steaming hot meal in front of me. You need to taste it, he said, handing me a spoon. I looked down at the dinner, leaning in to smell. Mmm, lamb stew, my favourite, I said, tucking him. I think the cook overdid it on the almonds, though. And I'll leave you to guess what happened.